Okay, welcome everyone. Welcome to our um, event on the Hidden um, Histories series organized by the SOAS uh, Library Decolonizing Working Group. Um, uh, welcome everybody. My name is Angelica Basquera. Um, I am one of the co convener of the series together with my colleague uh, who are here. Uh, you can say hello, turn your video on if you like, Ludi Price, Amapoku, and Fazana Qureshi. We are the co convener of the series. Hello there. And um, we are very pleased uh, um, of the result of the series, which was launched uh, this year. And uh, we have had uh, uh, five very uh, successful events. And we're hoping to continue um, the series in the next academic year. It's been really inspiring to hear uh, many different stories uh, from many different uh, individuals and organizations. And um, um, as um, some of you um, may already know, um, the aim of the series precisely is to bring about um, the hidden voices, the hidden histories of um, people um, from the African, Caribbean and Asian communities in the UK, uh, diaspora communities and beyond um, to talk about uh, their own um, experience and share vision of decolonizing knowledge production and therefore documenting the uh, voices and experiences of diaspora communities. Um, so that's a, a little bit about the series. And um, uh, I mean, some of you probably followed us before we had, as I said, you know, quite a few events that are all uh, uh, captured um, on our blog that um, perhaps Rudy, you might wanna put in the chat, the blog link. And if you miss some of our events, you're welcome to go back to them because these events are recorded tonight as well. The event is recorded. Um, therefore, if you miss some of the previous one, please uh, do go and listen to them. Um, OK, so this is, uh, this is a little bit about us. Uh, now I would like, um, I'll, I'll like to introduce the, uh, our speakers for, for tonight and to, um, to talk a little bit about uh, tonight's event uh, that is entitled Somali, Somali Storytelling, Our People, Home and Landscape. Um, as probably most of you know, um, Somalia had um, a long history of uh, upheaval and uh, there was a civil war in, 19, civil war in 1991 uh, that um, um, created a situation that uh, uh, one of the biggest humanitarian crises uh, of, uh, of recent times and um, a very uh, huge amount of people, diaspora, had to relocate uh, across the world, really. And it was um, an incredible uh, um, moment in history um, that tonight we would like to reflect on and, um, and, and to talk about um, you know, the, the experience, but also the experience of those that had to leave in Somalia at that particular time, uh, who were uh, probably very young, um, and we have here um, some of some of the uh, panelists that I'm going to introduce you um, now. Um, so our first panelist is Abira Hussein, uh, who is a curator of digital and virtual realities exhibition of Somali cultural artifacts and images from before the Somali Civil War. Um, and she's also an independent researcher and a curator specializing in Somali heritage, digital archive, migration and health. And in recent years, she's worked with the British Museum, the British Library, the London Metropolitan Archive, the Refugee Council Archive and the Somali Week Festival to deliver a number of projects and workshops engaging with the Somali community. And in 2017, very interestingly, interestingly she created a uh, one of the first VR experience of coming home in partnership with the British Museum and funded by the Brighton Digital Festival. Um, and it was shown as a success humanities lab. So we are very lucky to have here tonight Abira, who can uh, will, will talk to us about uh, the experience of um, you know, understanding heritage and um, how heritage um, of Somali heritage is, um, is experienced in, in, in this country and the, the work that she's trying to do to make uh, Somali heritage more prominent um, in the diaspora. Um, our second speaker is uh, Yusuf Shego. Uh, sorry, did, maybe I mispronounced Shego. Um, apologies. Um, Yusuf uh, is a part two architecture assistant uh, at an award winning international practice in Manchester. 
Uh, he was born in Mogadishu in Somalia um, and uh, he studied at Manchester School of Architecture where he gained his, uh, his bachelor and also his master of architecture. And while studying, he founded uh, the Somali architecture in 2015. Um, again, he started his own, uh, this is his own, his own initiative, um, and he started as a platform uh, to share images of pre-war Somalia. Uh, and, and then it evolved into a research project involved with the creation of historic buildings into 3D form. Um, so we're very looking forward to hearing from Yusuf um, his story. Uh, and in 2018, Somali architecture uh, have been invited to the London Design Biennale along with 40 other countries and cities to exhibit at Somerset, Somerset House, uh, revealing how design influences our emotion. And with the exhibition, what remains, um, um, the, the Somali civil, civil war were left, um, left its rich architectural heritage in ruins. As you can imagine, um, yeah, obviously heritage is one of the, as, as we've seen in, um, in Syria, um, is, is, a, is one of the ways in which war, um, you know, sort of presents itself by destroying um, all the heritage. So it would be very interesting to hear from Yusuf about his experience. Um, um, so just to co uh, conclude, I mean, there, there, there will be so much to say about uh, Yusuf, about all of them, so I'm trying to cut it short. Um, the work of Somali architecture has been featured in many news articles and publications. These include not only specialized news agencies such as Arch Daily, City Lab, Design Indeba, but also mainstream news such as the BBC, The Guardian, UNESCO Youth and Courts. Um, and just to end, uh, um, you, um, as it's like to be known, I guess, uh, was invited to give a talk at the Mogadishu Tech Summit, uh, where he was a guest speaker to talk about Somali architecture and the importance of preserving the country heritage. So, you know, very interesting. Uh, we're really looking forward to hear all of this. Um, our final speaker is going to be Mohammed Mohamud. Um, who studied international politics uh, and he has a very strong interest in development, conflict resolution and human rights. Uh, so it comes more from sort of political development uh, studies background and human rights. And he's the founder and uh, published author of an international platform called Somali Sideways. Um, so again, he developed um, this platform uh, that began as a photo project um, which was looking at repositioning the perception of Somali in the diaspora. Um, and as you, you know, unfortunately, we all know, uh, Somali um, um, people in the UK, Somali diaspora have suffered a lot of mis misrepresentations. And, and you know, we have been obviously constantly trying to push those boundaries. So um, it would be really good to hear exactly experiences and what uh, this young emerging um, Somali diaspora leaders are going to keep doing about this, um, this issue. Um, he also has an MSc in politics of conflict, rights and justice at SOAS. Oh, I didn't realize uh, you are an alum. <laughs> Brilliant. Uh, and uh, Mohammed has traveled to more than 23 countries, participated in speaking engagement, panel discussion, book events and signings, and his publication um, are called Somali Sideways. A photo book in changing the perception of the Somali and the Somali sideways Arawelo edition. Um, so that was the introduction of our panelists. Uh, without too much further ado, uh, I will, we would like to hear from them now rather than me. Um, and um, so we are all very um, excited to, to have you here. Welcome to SOAS. Uh, well, thank you for you know giving up your time to come and talk to us today, and uh, we're really looking forward to your presentation. And then after the presentations, we're gonna all come back for Q and A. So the attendees, uh, please put your question in the Q and A box, and we will try to answer your your question at the end uh, of the sessions. Uh, I will now pass it on to Abira, um, who is going to uh, to give her presentation. Many thanks. Uh, thank you, Angelica. I'm just going to share my um, screen. Just one moment. Uh, can everyone see my um, slides? Yeah. 
Okay. okay. Thank you so much. Um, thank you, Angelica, um, uh, Ludi, um, Amma, and Rosanna for inviting me um, in this uh, Hidden History series. Um, as Angelica mentioned, um, I have an interest in Somali heritage, um, being both from Somalia, but also um, in understanding how diaspora communities um, develop a sense of belonging and identity, particularly in countries that were once colonized um, their own. Um, and so I should, I should say that I'm not an archivist, um, but I def I'm interested in the process of archiving and uh, curation um, and how that plays a part in how we engage with our culture and how others um, perceive us. Um, and as the theme relates to hidden histories, I was particularly interested in how history is hidden through the process of categorization, um, the discipline of anthropology and ethnography, um, and also um, the process of colonization and how that um, led to the construction of museum and cultural spaces um, in a way by design uh, created the other and, um, and, and defined us as an inferior um, quote unquote um, kind of culture um, and how that persists today in our experiences um, when we engage with um, these cultural spaces. Um, and so initially my contact um, with uh, uh, kind of heritage that related to Somalia, um, I should just apologize and say that um, if I get interrupted, <laughs> my kids are across the door um, making a bit of noise. Um, and so this was the first image that I had come across. Um, and this is a carte de visite um, that was uh, collected um, as part of a project led by Autograph um, Association of Black Photographers. Um, they're a photography space based in Shoreditch, London, and their work is focused on the representation of Black, Asian and marginalized communities um, through, photo through photography. Um, and they received a significant grant from Heritage Lottery Fund um, on a project related called Missing Chapters of History. Um, no, sorry, my son's just walked in on the missing chapters of history. Um, and that project was looking at collections both found in personal, public, um, and uh, private archives. So these were images from the Getty Images, um, the National Portrait Gallery, and other personal collections. Um, and so this is an image of a Somali group um, that was taken in Crystal Palace in 1895. Um, and so it's a reconstruction of what they imagined to be um, a Somali village. Um, just one second, I'm just playing with a ball in my room. Uh, I'm just going to have to carry on. If you hear a ball, a ball bouncing in the room, please just ignore it. Um, and so this was a reconstruction of a Somali group, and this is a typical of how um, uh, I guess how the colonizers were represented and brought over um, as a kind of curious display of um, what was over there. Um, and so I, this was the kind of the first contact that I had. Um, and I guess the initial feeling was actually, this isn't something that I understand of my culture or, and um, in terms of how it was kind of constructed or reflected. Um, and so, Part of that was thinking, well, this is the only representation I have of Somali heritage. How do I um, think about constructing one that reflects how I experience my heritage, but also um, is from the perspective of uh, the Somali diaspora? Um, and so I was particularly interested in, and we just had this image without much information surrounding it, any kind of metadata or as the metadata and referring to kind of any other kind of contextual information about the people, the individuals. Um, photography is often used as a way of kind of silencing um, as well as, um, sorry, my son's just leaving, <laughs> a way of silencing and also subduing those that are in the photograph. Um, and so I was reflecting on how we're not named in records um, and also thinking about how the process of archiving, um, kind of how things are catalogued also um, fail to kind of name the people. Um, and I reference um, Sadie Hartman's book when she was in her book, The Venus Two Acts, reflecting on kind of 
uh, records related to enslaved um, African Americans um, when when all she had as documentation was ledgers, um, uh, kind of uh, notes um, about the individuals, um, sometimes quite violent, uh, um, and then thinking, well, how do you construct a history or a narrative or a way of understanding um, what their experiences were when these these are all the records that you have, um, and so. This, um, Caswell also referred to this as a type of symbolic annihilation, uh, where she said the ways that mainstream heritage and cultured, culture um, organizations kind of ignore, misrepresent, uh, malign. Um, and so, and that also relates to the discipline of anthropology. Um, and I was really interested in how this legitimizes power, um, enabled power um, to kind of continue as well as, um, thinking about um, how then when you have, when you come across these records, how you can use it as a tool um, to either tell different stories as well as uh, how we can use archiving to um, bear witness to other stories um, as well. Um, and so this resulted in a project which was called Healing Through Archives where I invited um, the Somali community to um, come to autograph um to share images um which i'll share later on um a lot of my work involves both looking at archives and museum objects um as i mentioned the discipline of kind of anthropology and archiving and information studies means that these segments are often separated um but for me i was reflecting on the work of um uh Otlet, where he mentioned that uh anything can be a document be it an object um an image a book um, or even a memory and so I was trying to think about how to even though the intellectual discipline had kind of separated these uh, collections um, how we could bring them together um, and so this image again is what I had come across these are kind of catalogues of the objects that were brought in um, uh, and, and donated to the British Museum with a brief description again um, and the, I guess the the theme is the idea of um, objects and descriptions but the people uh, and the place um, that were integral to this cultural heritage are often missing um, from from these documents um, and so I was thinking about how to use storytelling as a way of kind of weaving um, what knowledge we do have from museums and archives um, as well as knowledge from the diaspora try to create I guess what I refer to as a kind of recombinant history um, and so these are some images that were um, uh, donated as part of the Healing Through Archives project. Um, and this are images of uh, taken in Somalia um, before the Civil War. I was particularly in interested in before the Civil War because um, there were, I had experienced a lot of secondhand memories and stories from my parents about this time. And I really wanted to understand what this moment in history was for those who got to live through it, but also for those of us who may have only experienced it um, uh, through other stories um, or through family albums. Um, and so these images um, for me were a way of ev evidencing that memory um, and also thinking about how in a post-conflict society um, can, can these memories help us to find healing, to repair, to um, find a sense of belonging. Um, and so I was interested in not only our stories of migration, but also artifacts that we had brought over. Um, and particularly our own archives, because part of being colonized was that a lot of these objects um, and archives migrated uh, and exist both in museums, but also in the national archives. And they're particularly difficult for communities who have found independence, where these records are kind of taken away. The idea of building stability and independence, as well as um, uh kind of developing the nation is i guess hampered when parts of that history um is taken and brought over um and so i was interested in these images as well as um images that showed weaving that showed making um and so these were taken in um in 1982 um, and so also I was interested in the types of records that were found in cultural institutions. So for instance, um, the British Museum, which has the second largest collection of Somali objects and archives, you can find objects 
um, images, but also what you can find are images of um, rock art sites as well. Um, and so this is an image of um, a Somali rock art site in the northern part of Somalia called Laskel. Um, and when we're engaging with this type of heritage, it's often very linear, um, where it's difficult to find a connection to history that are thousands of years old. Um, and so I was also interested in how one creates um, a connection to this past when you are separated by thousands of years. Um, and Ruth Tringham speaks about the ideas of creating narratives um, and thinking about using database as well um, as doing that. So also thinking about place um, in the archive. Um, and so this is an image of a project that we, the beginning of an image of a project that we did um, that was looking at uh, Somali um, objects. And so just to kind of go back a step, I had mentioned that I was collecting or beginning to collect images from before the Civil War. Um, I was particularly interested in that time period because it was also thinking about stories of Somalis that had came over. Um, because a lot of the images when you do come into contact in archives were either kind of during the colonial time period or archives and records that related to housing issues that related to um, social issues, but not necessarily about Somali people, their experiences, um, who they were. Um, and there were other archives that you can find within um, the Maritime Museum, which relate to cruise registers lists. Um, and so as some of you may or may not know, the Somali community arrived here in um, the mid 1800s, um, initially as, as merchant seamen, um, when they were part of the British protectorate. Um, and then the second wave came after the Civil War. Um, and so those that arrived as merchant seamen um, settled across port cities like um, Hull, Liverpool, um, Cardiff, um, and, the East, and the East End. Um, and so those were the type of other histories that I was engaging with. And this project began as, uh, as part of a wider project by the British Museum, which was called um, Object Journeys. Um, and that was exploring how, as they refer to, source communities can better tell their stories or engage with um, museum collections. Um, and so the focus of this collection was thinking about um, Somali pastoralism, which is a significant part of Somali heritage, um, the environment in across the Somali regions, especially the northern northwestern part, is quite arid and dry, and so significant of the Somali pop, significant portion of the Somali population is nomadic, and a lot of the um, that meant that that development the creation of objects that were both mobile um, that they could carry with them on the back of their camel, um, and so it was utilitarian, but also it was really richly decorated, um, and so the majority of museum objects that are collected from Somalia were ethnographic um, objects. Um, and so that played a significant part of um, this display. Um, but part of the issue was that these objects and how they were displayed created a sort of um, uh, a, a binary um, in the sense that we were working with the museum, um, but it didn't really reflect um, how Somali cultural heritage is practiced considering that oral history and orality plays a significant part of Somali heritage. It was the mode of how knowledge was, trying, um, was shared, um, how information was shared. Um, and a lot of these objects, particularly in their making and their use would be associated with work songs, uh, which are often held in the British Library. Um, and so there was a bit of tension around, well, actually these objects are quite static um, and they don't really um, reflect how Somali heritage is practiced. And again, even though museums are kind of trying to move away from this idea of um, um, their difficult past, um, still when they're engaging with, as they refer to as source communities, um, we're still being documented. Um, and so that kind of led to the project, um, which you can see some of the engagement activities called the Nomad Project, which I worked on, which just thinking about the use of digital as a way of being able to think about representing multiple modalities and experiences using uh, an online platform such as uh, a games engine. Um, I know I don't have very long left, so I'm just gonna show a quick video of what the project was about. Hopefully you can hear.
Nomadic Somali people walk great distances, never staying in one place for too long. With each move, they take all their belongings with them, their animals, their possessions, even their homes. Imagine you had to carry all your belongings with you. What would you take? We would like to invite you to spend some time with a nomadic family, to see the objects and hear the songs which are part of their everyday lives. To find out more about these and other Somali objects, please visit nomad-project.co.uk um, and so the experience that you saw was um, a mixed reality experience um, and it was thinking about how to um, use things like motion capture, digitize objects from the British Museum and archival sounds to create an experience that reflects how the objects might have been used, um, the people that would have used them um, and kind of thinking about time and, 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 uh, and place as being important to reflect that. Um, and that also led to uh, workshops where we shared uh, experience because part of that was thinking about um, trying to decenter this um, this experience and this cultural heritage from museums uh, to community spaces um, and these are also the uh, other workshops we did um, part of the free word center where we invited people to use the um, augmented reality postcards um, and these were more um, images of workshops um, part of the project was also thinking about teaching digital skills um, and as well as um, thinking about how to democratize access to the, to the heritage was also the tools um, to, to be able to document as well. Um, and this is the archive that we created. Um, the other element was thinking about hidden histories was also how objects can be hidden um, in terms of how they're catalogued, how they're described. Um, and when they are digitized, um, it's often very difficult to, to find because they're not cat catalogued uh, correctly, but also the access to digitized objects that are freely available is also a challenge. Um, and so processes like digitization um, can also be, uh, can be also, can also uh, hide heritage, both in not allowing people to have access um, to those records. Um, and so these are the AR postcards as well. So it's also thinking about making the heritage accessible, um, not just uh, uh, an experience that requires a headset that can be expensive um, and prohibitive. I mean, this was also just trying to explore how everything connected together, both in the immersive experience, um, digitization and the learning. Um, it was very much about trying to decenter um, the museum space. And, and, and make community spaces and events integral to both the sharing of the cultural heritage, but also um, where the work was happening. Uh, yeah, so thank you. Um, and I'll stop now. Um, and then I'll introduce, uh, well, invite our, the next speaker, Yusuf Shago, to speak about um, Somali architecture. I'll just stop sharing. Hi everyone, can you see me? Yes. yes. Thank you. Um, I'll just share my screen. Thank you. Um, <clears throat> So uh, my name is Yusuf Shero, and uh, I'm the founder of Somali Architecture. And uh, I'll try to summarize what Somali Architecture is, uh, what we've been up to, and uh, the challenges we faced over, over the years. It's been exactly seven years since uh, we started a Somali Architecture, uh, but before I started back in 2015, uh, I first went back to Somalia in 2013. I was still second year of university in Sweden at the other time. 
uh, and before I went there, uh, there wasn't a lot of the uh, uh, architecture uh, available on the media or anything that I could uh, research about Somali architecture. And uh, at the time, uh, usually uh, for our family holiday, we go to Mombasa in uh, Kenya. Uh, that's where the majority of my family are. Uh, but this year, we went to, I decided, you know, let's go to Mokbishu. Uh, you know, I'm studying architecture. I want to see uh, what's out there. Uh, my brother was uh, working there as well at the time. So uh, I decided to go uh, to Mokbishu, uh, the city I once called home. Uh, every uh, afternoon when my brother finishes uh, work, uh, I would go around uh, the city uh, with him and the uh, we are a family of bakers, so we would he would usually tell me uh, when he was young where the, uh, where he used to sell the uh, traditional Somali food on the streets and everywhere. And uh, he knew about the city quite well uh, of how it used to be uh, before the war. And uh, he he would describe how amazing it, it was and uh, how you know it used to be called weapon of the Indian Ocean and uh, uh, the Switzerland of Africa. Uh, just to name a few, but for me, it was very difficult to imagine uh, this city actually existed or, you know, there, there could be such city as he was describing. But uh, what he was describing was uh, this image, or just one of the few images. Uh, where we took the picture was just behind the building here. And uh, so this is what he was talking about. This is what my whole family talked about when they say what well, the used to be amazing city. Uh, uh, the same picture was taken from a, a Hotel Aruba, a very famous uh, hotel in Mokdishu uh, before the war. Uh, it's completely destroyed now. And uh, I recently had one of my friends, you know, you, you would hear a lot of uh, stories from uh, the hotel. But uh, recently, one of my friends from Mokdishu said, you know, this is where his parents got married. And uh, this is Hotel Juba, uh, looking back towards uh, Hotel Aruba. This is where my grandfather used to work. And uh, again, when we were young, he used to tell us about what the city used to look like, uh, the delegators or other nationals who used to come to Mokbishu, uh, you know, the uh, basketball players, the uh, international basketball players that used to come, a uh, USA and everyone here. And uh, for me, uh, when I was researching about these images, you would usually go, you know, you, you have to dig deep, you have to go to books, you have to go, I have all images, the libraries, a few of them be the British Library or some of them in Italy. So if you search for Somalia on Google back then, you couldn't really find anything uh, that was uh, what the city used to look like. This is just one of the favorite buildings in the, in the ex-parliament. It just shows the, the multicultural, in the cities, in how the multicultural city used to be. A different architecture, different a faith a, that were existed in Mokbisha and it still exists in Mokbisha. And uh, this is what remains of that building. And uh, when I went back to 2013, this is what I was seeing throughout the city. Uh, it felt like you were walking in a, a war museum, a, just the historical part of Mokbisha. Uh, there's a lot of development, uh, but it, it was quite sad to see the uh, once very important buildings to be left off uh, like that. Uh, this is what's left over the, uh, the river. It's completely dis uh, gone now, but some of these buildings have been uh, re rehabilitated and they're in a good condition at the moment. And uh, going back to multi-faith, uh, what the city used to be, uh, this is the Roman Catholic church. This is what's left over the church. A um, Mogadishu used to have at least, a, well, it used to have three churches, and it's mind blowing to, you know, for a city like Mogadishu to have a, three churches. A, two of them were destroyed just before the war, a, this being the last one. And uh, this is what's left of the, the, the lighthouse a, of Mogadishu. Despite what's going on, despite what was going on back in, in the days, the city was growing, and uh, this is what the city is at the moment. This was taken in 2013. Uh, Mogadishu, uh, you know, will become one of the most uh, populated city in Africa by 2050, as uh, a lot of people are moving into cities. 
uh, you can see Mogadishu being one of them because uh, with the drought and climate change, you can just see how a 75% of uh, a worldwide population going towards city. And Mogadishu is a good example of that. Uh, unfortunate that we don't have the infrastructure to uh, deal with this influx of uh, population. And uh, now for over two years, uh, I've been collecting images uh, of what the city used to be like. Uh, I didn't know what to do with them. I had like uh, a lot of gigabytes of images on my laptop. Uh, but uh, so now it's 2015 when I started my master's uh, at Manchester. And uh, we were looking at the two weeks workshop, looking at uh, Manchester after the World War II. Uh, there was a lot of uh, master plans that were envisioned for a lot of cities in the UK. Uh, some of them did, uh, did got realized, some of them not. And uh, my group at Education Precinct, so uh, the universities, both universities of Manchester and uh, the Metropolitan, uh, these are just few sketches of the, the master plan uh, that were envisioned. Uh, they did the presentation at the uh, town hall to uh, showcase uh, what uh, the, these cities could be like after World War II. And we also did a 3D model of uh, these buildings that were uh, uh, proposed. Some of them they were uh, 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 built. Some of them were uh, built, but then uh, demolished uh, recently. And we did the uh, visuals of uh, uh, the show that is uh, put in the Manchester weather or the UK weather. Uh, we also did an exhibition uh, for it uh, at the uh, university. And um, uh, these are just some of my classmates and uh, Ahmed Moussa and Ahmed Jami, who later, uh, Ahmed Moussa later became a very important part in Somali architecture. And then the, going back to, so now I have the inspection, the images of the Somali architecture. Uh, so how did the making these models come to be? So I first looked at the church because the church was a, probably one of the most documented buildings in Somalia. You uh, just search anything to do with Somali architecture and uh, the church was the most available from construction to uh, demolition. Uh, at the time, I was very busy at university, uh, and I really loved the project. And uh, to the point where I was thinking of dropping out of university, uh, it would have been a disaster, thank God. Uh, uh, I started hiring people uh, to work with me. Uh, just uh, I didn't think of it the uh, architecture would become a, a startup. Uh, I was uh, asking my tutor for advice because he, he was um, teaching us at the time, and he said, uh, just either do it yourself or hire someone to go along with. And the majority of these buildings, some of them are destroyed, some of them still there, some of them rehabilitated. Uh, this is a image of the lighthouse. And uh, uh, so from one building to two to you know a, a whole city, some of these buildings are uh, very detailed, some of them uh, just amassing and some of them uh, we were using Google Maps and uh, OpenStreetMap to locate them where they are, and uh, we didn't really have the resource or the, the money to actually do a proper survey of these buildings uh, at the time. Uh, from one building to one district, to at least uh, three districts in uh, Mogadishu. So uh, now I have all this, uh, you know, content uh, things, uh, you know, archival images, 3D model. It was too good for me just to keep hold of it for myself uh, because I just wanted what, uh, to see what's out there or if anybody would be interested in uh, such a thing. Uh, and one of the reasons why or uh, why do, did I want to do this was to raise awareness because when I started looking into some other architecture, there was no inspiration for me. There was no uh, anything available or on on on. The, the internet. So I really wanted to go all out on uh, raising awareness or uh, make a huge campaign to raise awareness. So uh, at the time, there was a lot of social media pages that were looking at the uh, history of Somalia, history of, uh, you know, a bit of the culture. 
but there wasn't one particular one that was focusing on architecture. And it, so it was just resharing everything that I found. Now, a lot of these images were available on the, on the internet, but they didn't have a story behind it. A, nobody really did a, a detailed a, explanation of a, what they are, why, where they're there. And we looked at a, one of the series, we looked at mosques around uh, in Somalia. And uh, mosques really mean a lot to me personally because when I was young, uh, so after the war, a born in Mogadishu, and then we moved to and then it just uh, grows the city, and then we moved to Barawe. Now, when we were in Barawe, uh, every time there was like explosion or there was like fights between two major tribes, uh, a lot of people used to run towards uh, the mosque. Uh, and people would be like, oh, this is a safe place. Uh, you know, nobody would come here. It was a sanctuary place for, you know, neither of the tribes would come into the mosque, uh, uh, you know, to, to start a fight or anything like that. So uh, until now, uh, places of worship, including churches or any uh, other place of worship, uh, I really love just me personally. I'm just from architectural background. I'm just a huge fan of it. So I uh, still like uh, with social media, we still didn't make a huge impact uh, because there, uh, there wasn't like a, a place where all of these information were located. So we did a, a website for it uh, where this is where it comes from. So one of my friend, it comes to play. And so just again, the uh, platforms like a resharing 3D model. So if you're wearing a VR, you can actually be able walk around these buildings uh, at a human scale. And then we use uh, Snapchat filters. Uh, I won't go into detail, but uh, it had that 50 million view just to raise awareness, just to show, hey, there's uh, a lot of uh, interesting buildings in Somalia, and uh, this is just a few of them. And now this is where, uh, so we have the 3D models, we have the archival images. We thought, okay, let's get into the media. Let's showcase these buildings and, you know, let's see what the media will say about it. Because usually the media are interested in either destruction, uh, specifically for Somalia, they're either more interested in destruction. Uh, nobody would, would be interested in uh, interesting stories like this or what Somalia used to be like or what Somalia could be like, uh, forgetting what the current situation. And, uh, again, we went back to the, the church because uh, this is where Medina, uh, the editor, comes into play. Uh, at the time, she was at the, the church and it was celebrating 92 years since it was inaugurated. And we thought it's a good idea to make an article about it because uh, just to showcase how multi faith it used to look, it used to be. And we did a proposal for it as well. And uh, one thing we didn't know was the site still belongs to Roman Catholic Church or the Italians. So it's the, the, the Roman Catholic Church. So no one can actually build anything in the city in this area. And uh, another building we looked at was the National Theater. Uh, this one has been refurbished uh, now, uh, luckily. Uh, this is how it to be uh, just after the war, like uh, the roof was missing. Uh, we did like a few visual. As uh, architects, uh, we like to showcase like uh, from our research stage to what it is right now and then what it could be. So we just wanted to envision, uh, especially as young architects, uh, we were very ambitious, like um, we really want to make a difference. And uh, if not uh, us, uh, who else would uh, make a difference? our city and uh, not only looking at single building but going uh, further and uh, looking at the whole city or in a few other cities in a few other areas within the city looking at the, uh, the international airport uh, this is all done like uh, with the student budget student timing so we didn't really have major uh, you know these images they take quite a lot of time to make but we, we just did because we were having fun or we like doing it. And so in the press, I recently came across was, uh, the, this is the, the, what we found it very challenging. So this is something that we came across recently was, if you search for Mogadishu on the internet, uh, you will see a lot of 
because of the media or the Western media uh, using Mogadishu, this is what you would see. And, and then if you Google Mogadishu in Somalia, you would see the good side of uh, Mogadishu. We thought the, uh, it goes back when I was starting research, I would I never Googled Mogadishu. Okay. And it never crossed my mind to Google Mogadishu. Uh, so we found it really, really challenging to get into uh, the media. So we did like uh, the article of the church, and then we got like, uh, we sent it to almost 50 journalists to have a look at it. None of them got back to us until after daily. They said, hey, we are, uh, you know, what you guys did are it's quite interesting. And I think it's worth, uh, it's worth, it's worth it to publish. And uh, finally, we made it, uh, you know, it, it wasn't, it was big at the time for us anyway. And uh, we finally made it to uh, mainstream media uh, at Daily, which is showing Somali architecture. Uh, so it's something that's not distraction, something that's not politics, uh, completely different to your everyday Somali news, which is the architecture. And then the rest followed, uh, or other people followed. Uh, from that, uh, I'll just quickly run through these. Uh, so we did an exhibition. Again, part of the raising awareness was quite interesting uh, to be invited to this uh, uh, Biennale or exhibition because uh, we we just wanted to showcase architecture, or we just wanted to showcase the the, the interest in Palm Smallies. and it was an emotional state. Uh, how does design influence the, uh, our emotion? And uh, I remember when I first went back to Somalia, it really, it felt like uh, you're walking in a war museum. Uh, it was really an uh, achievement for us to be uh, exhibiting uh, these countries. And again, uh, it was visited by 200,000 uh, at the Somerset House, uh, just as part of uh, our campaign. Uh, some of these countries had a budget of 250,000 pounds, whereas we were using student finance and crowdfunding uh, money to uh, participate in the exhibition. And then we did another exhibition in Manchester. Uh, this is looking at uh, Mancunians in Manchester, artists, poets uh, that lived in, in Manchester. Again, we attracted a different audience in Manchester as well. Uh, showcasing a uh, architecture and the a lot of the our audience is not just Somalians or uh, you know uh, we attract all types we, we are making architecture completely uh, something that the younger generation would be interested in uh, the background is quite boring it's quite daunting to the research but we thought uh, let, let's make it interesting and then from that we got another gig which is at UNESCO uh, to, uh, to participate at Africa uh, Week, uh, we were looking at uh, innovation. So how can, can we use technology uh, with heritage? And uh, this time we're using the VR headsets to showcase uh, uh, the 3D model. Uh, we, we have a small space, so we have to become creative on how we can showcase everything. And uh, at the time, uh, so this is uh, uh, Audrey Azuli, the Director General of UNESCO. Uh, at the time, uh, I jokingly said we should come to Somalia uh, instead of using the VR you can see in real life. And uh, she took that seriously and she did come to Somalia. Uh, if if uh, you're not aware, but UNESCO, Somalia did not sign UNESCO convention until 2019. Uh, before that, uh, we, we were not able to uh, to assign like a city or to assign a single building as important heritage. But now with the Somali signing the convention, we're able to do that. And then I was also invited back to Somalia uh, to showcase the, what we've been working on. Now this goes back to the raising awareness because majority of the audience thought what I was showing was a proposal. Uh, what I was showing was a uh, uh, what the city can be. Well, the video was what the Somali used to be like, and a lot of people thought, okay, that is what we are proposing. And uh, to finish off, so what's next? I'm currently uh, just uh, collecting all of these information that I've been working on. 
the and turning it into a catalog. It's not big enough for a book. So I'm currently working on a, a exhibition, a digital exhibition with the, uh, this group called uh, Space Popular. A digitizing everything we have. So since majority of our audience are a global and uh, a exhibiting in one space was not really, a, we were not having the same impact. So we thought since the pandemic, everything going digital, a, let's do a digital exhibition. And uh, that's me. I'll just show a quick video of uh, the 3D model. And uh, that's me. And uh, I'll now pass it on to uh, Mohammed Mahmoud. Um, no? Yeah, Hello? can you, can you un unshare screen, Yusuf? Thank you. Hi, everyone. Uh, can you hear me? Yeah. Yes. OK, great. I'm going to share my screen now. Okay, uh, thank you guys. Um, I would like to thank uh, Fazana for inviting me to the Hidden History Somali Storytelling uh, webinar series. Uh, thank you, Angelica, for, for the introduction. Um, so my project is called Somali Sideways. Um, my name is Mohammed. I'm the founder. Um, I'm going to be talking a little bit uh, about my project, how it started, um, and, uh, and where it's heading. A lot of the time, um, I always ask non-Somalis um, this question, um, which is, what's the first thing they think of when they hear about Somalis um, or Somalia um, or the Somali region as a whole? Um, and one of the things, uh, one of the reasons why I ask them this question in particular is because um, I want them to basically um, give an honest uh, feedback um, on what they, on what they, uh, what they've uh, perceived. And a lot of the time, it's uh, it's negative connotations, um, you know, um, like terrorism, famine, piracy, um, and failed state, and a lot of those things um, derive from obviously from what they see online, um, 
and 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 uh, the media uh, as a whole um who yeah um who haven't really done a good job in showcasing um the somali culture um and and the somali people um and this is one of the driving forces as to why i started this whole project um somali sideways so one of the things that um that started this project was I was at university doing my first degree um, international politics at Brunel. Um, and I read an article in 2014, um, in early 2014, that um, uh, Al Shabaab did uh, um, committed a suicide uh, attack um, uh, near the Somali uh, parliament. Um, and it was a highly organized attack. And when I started reading it, I, I said to myself, like, why is it that um, a lot of the things are negative uh, when it comes to Somalia uh, and the Somali region? Um, and, you know, and why are most of the news coverage on the Somali region about uh, all these negative um, uh, connotations? Um, and there wasn't enough uh, coverage showing uh, Somalis in, uh, in a positive light. So basically, I wanted to do something about it in my uh, in my own uh, in my own time, um, and there was an issue because I didn't know how to uh, how to go about it. Um, you know, my my skills were. Um, I mean, I still have these skills. Um, you know, I I like taking photos of people, um, and I wanted to basically use my photography skills and. To create some sort of uh, visual storytelling uh, platform online um, and in the beginning i wanted to use my photography in showcasing somalis um, in an artistic way and and illustrating um, their lives on 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 a, on a social media platform um, this is where the idea of somalis standing sideways came about um, i gathered some of my friends um, and yeah, initially they they kind of thought I was going crazy because they were like, "Why are you going to take photos of of us standing sideways? Um, it's a bit weird. I don't think people will, will will understand the concept and 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 all of that stuff." So yeah, it's safe to say that they were very uh, very skeptical about the whole the whole idea and the whole project. Um, uh, but nevertheless, um, you know, good friends, they they. They support you, even if it is a crazy idea. So I gathered some some friends of mine, and uh, I started taking photos of them standing sideways. And I would ask um, a few questions about their lives, um, you know, what they what they plan to do. Um, some of the stories were about civil war. Um, you know, uh, what what was it that was um, uh, that made you uh, who you are today? Um, you know education so i would ask them about the educational background or ask them about what their goals and aspirations are um whether it's business or entrepreneurship um, or anything like that um so uh i started sharing it on on an instagram platform um so i created a logo um through the help of a friend um i i, I set up a page and then i started posting it day by day um of all all of my friends initially in the beginning um but one thing I didn't realize was this project grew um, out of my control, so to speak. Um, it, there was a lot of Somalis that, that wanted to get involved um, from around the world. Um, Somalis that are in Europe, um, Somalis that are in uh, North America, Somalis that are in Australia, um, Somalis that are in Africa as well. So the project kind of grew uh, into a global, uh, a global platform. So this book, uh, Somali Sideways Photo Book in Changing Perceptions of the Somali, um, uh, all the photos that I've gathered um, of the Somalis that I've interviewed um, since 2014, um, when the project began. Um, and then once the project started, um, I basically wanted to basically uh, create some sort of uh, tangible uh, book um, so that people can take away from it. Um, and then once I started getting, 
all these Somalis uh, involved. Um, this book idea was uh, in help of um, a brother called Mohammed Arten, who, all, who basically is, uh, runs a publishing platform called Luft Press. Um, and uh, one of the things uh, that was unique was this particular publishing platform focuses on Islamic and, and Quran sort of studies and Somali history and all of that stuff. Um, so for him to do this kind of project was kind of new and I've never published a book in my life. So it was kind of a unique journey for both of us. Um, so yeah, this project, um, uh, this book, project term book uh, was published in 2018. Um, and my goal was to basically um, go around the world. Uh, initially, my plan was to go around the world and uh, do book events and talk about my project um, to Somalis and non-Somalis alike. One of the things that, um, that, uh, that was very like, amazing about this project was I got to interview a lot of Somalis that were world-renowned in, in, uh, in various fields. Um, and one of them was Ilhan Omar. Um, she took part in the project in 2015. And um, she was one of the, uh, the people who was very supportive of my project um, and still is to this day. Um, so at the time, she was running as a state legislator in, uh, in Minnesota, um, and she was running a campaign uh, so that she can win that, win that post, um, which she later won, uh, becoming the first Somali-American um, to be a legislator in the United States um, at the time. And um, later on, she basically became uh, a U.S. representative um, in the November elections. Um, and she basically won it. And there was a lot of um, other notable uh, Muslim women that won it as well, like Rashida. Um, so yeah, they not only did uh, Ilhan Omar became the first Somali to do so, she became one of the first um, Muslim uh, women to be elected in the United States House of Representatives. There was also um, a Somali famous singer called Ar Manta who took part in the project as well. Um, and also uh, uh, an individual who um, was part of the project called Hodan Alai, um, who passed away in Hammer, um, uh, in, sorry, in Mayo, uh, through a deadly uh, so, um, an attack, basically, um, an explosion. Um, so she, yeah, she was one of the people that was involved in the project. Um, so this whole project um, was involved by uh, myself and a few others involved um, who interviewed Somalis from around the world, um, those that are in the local community um, and those that are in the national and international uh, communities as a whole. So this whole project um, uh, enabled me to visit a lot of countries. Um, I got to uh, network with Somalis. Uh, my first book, um, event took place in London um, in July of 2018. And I got to visit more than 20 countries, um, places where I would basically support um, Somalis and um, that I've done with Somali Sideways. Um, one of the notable places that I went to that was unique was I visited China. Um, and uh, my book is currently at the Nanjing Library. Um, one of the first books to be in the African um, section of the library. And um, the, one of the things that, uh, that was unique to them was that they'd never, um, they never knew um, Somalis um, and their stories and the things that they've done. Um, a lot of the time they, they heard about the negative uh, connotations that comes with it. Um, so my main objective with this whole project and book was I wanted people to change their misconceptions on how the world views the Somali region um, and how the world views the Somali people. Um, and a lot of the time, uh, my first question that people ask me as well is um, why is it that, uh, that you've came up with this uh, idea of people standing sideways? Um, and one of the reasons why I did that was because I wanted to draw uh, into this concept that 
um, people choose a certain aspect of their lives uh, that they want people to share. Um, and that's the side that's visible to, to the person, um, to the viewer. And the side that's hidden is the side that a certain um, aspect of lives is kept within that no one else knows. And that's the side that's not visible. Um, so, and yeah, essentially remains a mystery. So um, this project is, uh, objective was to focus on the misconceptions um, and also the book covers um, complex and diverse stories um, such as identity um, and immigration and also um, how others um, deal with the normal flow of their everyday lives. So if you have any questions, um, feel free to uh, feel free to ask me. Um, my main objective is to continue doing this, um, obviously due to the, the safety of COVID. Um, and uh, I always love to collaborate with uh, other organizations, um, uh, artists, organizations, um, creative organizations, um, and hopefully to continue that in the future. Um, also, if you would like to grab a copy of the book, um, feel free to uh, either message me um, uh, or email me. Um, and you can also follow my socials um, over there on Instagram and Twitter. So, yeah, thank you very much for, for, for listening. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mohammed. Um... If you could stop sharing the screen and we can call everyone back for the Q&A now. Yes, thank you. Um, okay. Here we go. Thank you, everybody. Wow. Well, I'm very sort of... <laughs> It was very interesting presentation, all of them. Um, I mean, so much to talk about and um, so many issues have been raised. And, you know, uh, I really don't know where to start because they were all fantastic presentations, starting from Abira, uh, you know, with historical and the archive, which resonate so much to me because I also work um, on archives and then going into the more contemporary um, um, situation of perceptions, which uh, you know it ties in so well in in this presentation. Um, so yes, it's extremely interesting. You know, very pleased to see all these things taking place, and uh, you know we will definitely uh, trying to collaborate with all of you absolutely because uh, this uh, has to. Um, expand, you know, everybody should really take it on board and try to connect uh, with this type of initiatives. Um, so I won't, I won't speak too long because, uh, yes, as a lot of chair, you don't want to take over. Uh, but there were a lot of comments, very positive comments in the, in the chat. Uh, our audience, uh, um, if you have specific questions, uh, would you like to put them in the Q&A or uh, if you raise your hand, Am I, you can even, I mean, we don't have, uh, we have a, like a small audience, so I'm happy to uh, people to, to say the question if they prefer. Um, so you can raise your hand. Um, there's as an a question attendee. in the chat. Uh, there's a question in the chat. Okay, so let me pick it. Um, okay, sorry. Um, all right, yeah, so we have a question uh, here from Ida Ajivayanis. Hello, Ida. Uh, Ida is uh, one of our colleagues at SOAS. She's actually been chairing some of these uh, uh, seminars. Uh, so thank you so much, Ida, for joining us. Uh, and thank you for your question, which I'll read it out. Um, uh, so Ida's question is uh, thinking of COVID and how it affected Somalis in London. Did you get to document a hidden side that we didn't see in the news? We saw Uber drivers and bus drivers hit, but was that all? Um, so, yes, very interesting question about, yes, the com contemporary uh, situation, how Somali were affected. Um, so, um, po possibly Mohammed or Yusuf or Abira, who, who wants to take it? I think the question was for me, because, yeah, I said Somali side. Yes. <laughs> no problem. Um, yeah. So, uh, yeah, that's a good question. Um, I think with the with the whole COVID situation, um, 
it actually hasn't crossed my mind to do a project um, of how like COVID affected Somalis. Um, I've seen a lot of uh, a lot of Somali organisations in the UK. They've done books on how COVID affected um, the Somali community, um, but I think it would be a really good uh, good idea um, into basically showcasing um, the the stories of how they what they went through. Um, the struggles that they went through uh, with COVID. Um, and uh, yeah, that's something I'm working on a new project and that could be uh, a project that uh, I could I could focus on, yeah. Any, anybody wants to add any comment? Uh, I would. I mean, there was a a, a big pivot towards um, digital um, initiatives. I think museums that weren't as digitally in engaged had to think about how to engage audiences with their collections. Um, and in that sense, when we're talking about, I guess, hidden histories, um, there was work around kind of creating better access. I I I think. Um, what it revealed for me anyway was, I think that we were aware of the inequality, but I think it was just exacerbated because digital inclusion, um, well, there were issues around digital inclusion, around um, digital literacy. Um, and so kind of some organizations were able to pivot and to be able to support um, uh, kind of small individuals, but I think some activities completely ceased um and they haven't continued um and so but i think particularly because my project is interested in the use of digital in some ways it also it, with other audiences it helped to kind of accelerate because i know there was a project that was happening in camden um with i think a camden heritage center based in kentish town um and they did a project with the british library actually where they held listening sessions um, and a lot of people were able to participate with that. Um, um, so I know things like that had supported, but I don't, um, I think it's, it, for, some, for some people, I think it made things more hidden um, during the COVID experience. Um, um, and, and so, yeah, I think it, and sometimes it highlights what is available um, already to kind of make available to the public in terms of like digital collections. Um, but yeah, so I, I don't know. I, I found that a lot of work stopped. Um. Okay, thank you. Um, okay, um, I have a question for Abira. Um, Abira was, because uh, I'm very interested in um, um, how you're looking at the archives mm -hmm. and um, how, um, you know, in the UK, yes, this idea that the archives, uh, it's about the sort of, um, um, documenting the British experience. Uh, many times I hear this, this sentence and uh, that's always struck a chord because to, to me the um, uh, archives are actually the experience of so many different people. And um, as, you, as you said, the big problem is how do you bring out the voices that are completely hidden and they are, um, um, you know, sort of been hidden by this idea of the the one missionary or the one colonial that collected and therefore owns the, but actually inside the collection, <laughs> there is a lot more to unpack. And, uh, and I'm interested in this idea of how do we go back to the archives and, uh, and take out the voices um, as you, you, know, you suggest. So I would like to hear a little bit more about uh, your views on that and um, how we can bring, you know, uh, youth um, organization uh, of, of diaspora organization and uh, and bring them to the archive and then re, re, revisit, rewrite, re, so re reinterpret uh, the, the archive that we have. Uh, <laughs> well, that's my PhD research right there. That I, to, I don't have a, I wouldn't say I necessarily have the answer. I think for me, the archive, yeah, historically, uh, well, I mean, we think about I, my, my, a lot of my research has been interested in like what have been the what is the purpose of, of archiving in what we understand in terms of the West um, of museums. Um, and, and I guess as some of we understand it was part of 
the story of subjugating uh, people um, in in the, across the east and um, the global south. Um, um, and so, uh, when these structures were about power and about um, the state and about perpetuating perpetuating that excuse me um then it becomes difficult then to see the archive as something that we can turn to something that is uh that we can refer to in terms of understanding our culture um and, and our heritage um so the archive in itself is a thing that also needs to be studied not just the content um and how it was organized the idea of categorization as i've mentioned the the um the archiving process both the kind of the physical catalogues in what was written you know i guess these 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 disciplines um were designed to be able to make them scientific and so my, my, a lot of my reason what it was lost in that process and i think people and um and, and their stories um and and so for me the object or the archive doesn't become something that's just about um understanding um it doesn't become a way to classify people it's I, I guess i want to use the object in the archive as a way of being able to examine um and use it as a tool to be able to examine that history that entanglement with colonialism um with empire with com commerce um, um with people's stories um and to be able to explore that um that hybridity um, through things like storytelling. I meant I referenced Sadia Hartman in her book, uh, Venus in Two Acts. She uses something she calls critical fabulation, which is a type of storytelling um, to try to imagine what the people were, what their lives were. Um, uh, and, and, and so part of that then for me is working with the Somali diaspora really to understand um, what, what these objects mean to them. Um, what stories, what poetry, um, what other history can we draw from um, these objects um, and, and how to uh, use that as a way of being able to talk about wider issues as well. It's not just about creating more opportunities to document and collect and again fix that, his that history as, as it was done before, but also thinking about um, and I guess Mohammed was mentioning this idea about why and also use of wider issues around uh, identity, around uh, reconstruction, around repair, around kind of the inequality that we're facing. Um, so that using that as a mechanism to do that. So I find storytelling um, or because of kind of orality being integral to Somali culture, I'm interested in things like poetry um, as a way of being able to um, draw meaning um, from these objects um, and these archives. Um, and I think working with young people, the thing that we found was that for them, they may not necessarily have a lot of, well, they, they, they feel like they don't. I mean, they may have stories. Sorry, sorry if you hear kids screaming. <laughs> you may hear stories um, uh, about Somalia, but it's often from your parents. Um, um, and so part of some of the workshops we were thinking about was creating that knowledge exchange because perhaps in Somalia, like those interactions would have enabled you to understand where you were being in the place is uh, can play a significant part of um, helping you to um, have that meaning. So part of it was also allowing people just to be together because actually there aren't many community spaces where people can meet, where people can talk, where people can exchange. Um, people are kind of isolated physically um and and so we were thinking about using digital you know whatsapp was also something that we were interested in as well as a tool because that's how at the moment people share information through voice notes through uh, messages um also looking at social media as well i guess also thinking about using digital platforms that people are comfortable using um as well so i guess part of our work is acknowledging the history that is in museums um and um, but also thinking about other ways of being able to connect that knowledge with what exists outside um, of museums, um, both in people's memories, um, uh, in, in movement, um, uh, and yeah, and finding ways of being able to connect people to that. But I don't, I, I, I don't know what fully the answer to that question is. I'm still trying to think about um, 
but I think storytelling can play a big part and just being with each other um, I think is important as well Yes, thank you so much. Thank you. Definitely answer my question. Uh, and it's, a, it, it's an open question in the sense, yes, it's a, it's a, it's a big question. Uh, it's about finding ways. And I think you, you do have an idea of how to find new ways of understanding this idea of history museum. Even the idea of the museum, what is the museum? How can we change um, this vision that we had that uh, static for so long? Mm -hmm. uh, anyway, I, I have my colleagues uh, with the uh, raised hand. Uh, so there was Ludi. Uh, Ludi, you had your uh, hand raised for a while. Um, I don't know if you want to come in. Or, uh, yeah, and then it was Farzana also. So Ludi first. I don't know if my, my question would need a long time to answer, but I was just going to ask Yusuf if he, if he had any stories that he could share from people who have seen his work and remember how how the city used to be before um when they were experiencing it whether they it brings back memories for them and things like that uh, yeah usually um very very small uh, during exhibitions uh, people will usually come uh, talk about the uh, their time in Mogadishu before the war so some of these people have never come back in and uh, I've recently been in contact by a lot of uh, ex-Italian soldiers that were in Somalia. The uh, uh, soldiers or just the uh, Italian family that used to live in Mogadishu. Uh, I, I don't even speak Italian, but uh, they would usually contact me, email me, uh, and I just use Google Translator to talk about my experience. Uh, but yeah, a, a lot of people do contact uh, to tell me uh, the story. Uh, a lot of people, uh, what are they called? Um, they used to do like road trips uh, around Somalia, uh, from the north all the way to uh, to south. Uh, I think uh, back in the sixties, the, the the security guard who was at the London Design Biennale, uh, his family used to live in. Tanzania, I think, and then when a, uh, what's his name, a uh, dictator, a uh, Amin or something. Uh, you, you were, uh, yeah, yeah, so the yeah, dictator, me? yeah, yeah, that one. So the, uh, when there was, um, when there was a lot of fights uh, during that time, I think the, a lot of uh, Indians were being uh, um, kicked out of their houses, businesses, uh, and this guy, uh, he, he was British, but he had to leave uh, um, Tanzania and he was either go to Kenya, East Africa, Kenya, uh, Uganda or Somalia. And uh, at the time, Kenya was also going through a really interesting period. So uh, his op only option was to go to Somalia. And uh, you know, he said he, he was so welcomed with the whole family. And this guy is a very, very random guy at the, the museum. He was a security looking up after our exhibition. Um, another guy, he, I think uh, he was Christian and uh, he, looking at the church, he, he, they used to come there with their family, a Sunday service, and uh, yeah, did, I mean, a Sunday service, um, they used to go to the Mogadishu church. They had a lot of images. Uh, but yeah, I, I do at least once or twice a month, I do get people sharing this story about Somalia. Uh, Usually, and uh, a lot of them have a lot of images of what the city used to look like uh, before the war. And um, you, you will never, ever, ever think that uh, there was a British or American family that lived uh, there uh, in Mogadishu. And yeah, it's just very, very fascinating. I, especially the Italians, because uh, some of them used to send me images of the airport when they were in, in uh, during their service, like two, three years in Mogadishu. Uh, it goes as far as uh, Pakistan, I think, people from Pakistan. Uh, yeah, I do, I do get a lot of uh, stories from people. That's great to know the kind of impact that your work is having on people, bringing back memories and things. So. Yeah, like uh, yeah, in the whole country, not many people have documented, but these uh, people in, you know, who used to go there, like uh, my city, the city that I actually grew up in, Barao, is all the way south, not 
and many pictures are available online. So this uh, this interest, like they're not even interested in architecture, they're just, just interested in sharing their stories and they will send us. And I think the one of the, again, another ex US soldier retired and he had like a whole, like, I don't know how many archival images he said, I would be more than happy to donate these images because he had it for so many years and nobody was interested in it. And then he, come, he came across an article uh, on, I think it was Forbes, uh, Forbes uh, journal. And they're like, oh, uh, again, this, uh, Forbes is completely different the audience. It's like, oh, we, uh, I looked at your article and I think it's quite interesting for you to take these images from us. Uh, there are some images of the inside of the parliament, you know, during the, when there was a lot of parliament going on back then. A lot of these images, there's no interior pictures. So yeah, there's, there's a lot. Thank you. Wow, excellent. Um, okay, I'm just a bit conscious of the time. Uh, we got a few minutes, few minutes left, but um, Frazana, uh, come yeah, in. Yeah, if, if I could get in then, I'm trying to get in. Yes, yes, absolutely. Because I've got my yes. son running in and out as well. That's fine, um, we, we don't so mind. I actually had two questions. I wanted to say thank you so much. It was so inspiring. And um, I'm so, so happy that you all could talk today. Um, Yusuf, I wanted to ask the um, images that you're documenting and, and storing now, would these be available to share openly with libraries? Is there something that we could add to our digital library collection? Or is, I mean, is that something like about, I'm, I was also checking about copyright and things like that. Uh, in terms, actually, uh, I'll just speak on copyrights. Uh, before 1980s, I think, or 90s, Somali didn't have any copyrights uh, with any images. So mm. I didn't know that's quite interesting. So a lot of images, in Somalia before the war, there was no copyright issue. So if you do find any images, you can use it anyway. However, there is a, the, a, the Rome, Rome School of Architecture, I think. They, they have a lot of archival images there. We, we do want to like uh, collect all the architectural images because if you look at the data, it's just, it's, it's huge to mm. go through. So we want to filter out all the architecture and place it in our website to have like a place where if you search for architecture of Somalia, you can just come in to you know our website. Uh, we do find it challenging because there's a, a huge cultural uh, challenges, which is why architecture, why Somali architecture, why archival images. So we, we are trying to bridge between the elders and the new generation, which is this is history. We, we need to, you know, a place a huge uh, importance in this. So uh, for us to have like archival place, or we, we need a lot of resources. We need a lot of uh, mm -hmm. uh, what do you call it? Uh, money to to fund all this. Uh, so there's that challenge uh, as well. So everything that we do is uh, based on exhibition. Uh, every exhibition we raise money to do just the exhibition, and we never have like a research where. Uh, I, I, I was speaking to my tutor just recently and he said, you need to collaborate with like a institution to make sure you archive all this architecture. Okay. Absolutely, yeah. Okay, thank you. I just had one other question. It was to Muhammad. I wanted to ask quickly, if you could just tell it, are you working on anything new? Do you have any other new ideas for more publications? Anything in the pipeline? Yeah, yeah. I mean, uh, I do. Um, I do have uh, a project that I'm working on. Um, it's because uh, this book um, was published in 2018 and the project started in 2014. Um, my plan is to hopefully um, interview the same people uh, as I did before again to see how their lives have mm -hmm. developed since then. Um, yeah, so, you know, I'm, I'm sure things have uh, developed with a lot of them. So, yeah. The interview with them again um, to see where their lives have, have gone um, if they're still doing the same thing that they said that they were set to do or have they um, uh, moved into a different uh, career path or a different pathway in life so yeah that's something I'm, I'm working on. That's brilliant. Yeah it's really inspiring for I think the young young Somali people as well really. Thank you. Thank you.
Uh, thank you very much, everyone. Uh, I mean, there could be so much more to talk about, and uh, but um, I think this is the start of a conversation, hopefully, with us. And uh, your projects are so fascinating. Um, and um, so, you know, we really will be thinking about, you know, how to take this forward and, um, and possibly, you know, bring other events or other ways in which also for you think about SOAS, possibly an institution, if you need one to support you, we're here and uh, we are, you know, we really want to support um, initiatives like yours. And uh, I think, you know, we are really trying to kind of push those boundaries, as I was saying at the start. And um, so um, if any, I'm, I mean, I don't know if you want to have a final comment. Uh, before we close um, the the event today, um, and as as we said, the event is recorded. It's going to be available on our YouTube channel, uh, the Source YouTube channel, within the next few days. Uh, we will share the link with all of you, and uh, you know, let's keep sharing and and keep talking, keep communicating about these very important issues. Uh, I think Ludi maybe want to say a comment, or Amma, do you want to say something before we close? I just want to say that, um, oh, Yusuf has just replied and so has Abira, that someone someone in the chat wants to keep in touch with all you guys. So, um, Mohammed, if you put your um, contact details in there at all, um, someone would love to get in contact with you about your work. Um, other than that, I don't have anything really to add except thank you for coming and sharing sharing your work with us. It's been yeah, thank you so much. Thanks for inviting us. Yeah, I really appreciate it. You're welcome. Thank you. Thank you so much. Okay. Thank you, everybody. So we close the event, uh, and thank you so much for coming. Some of the attendees have already left. Uh, probably had to dash off, uh, mm -hmm. but we did have a quite a quite a big big audience earlier. Yeah. And as I said, we will uh, keep pushing this the recording because what we do is we do share still share it with our network uh, mm -hmm. for those that couldn't couldn't attend it. Um, okay, so anyway, thank you so much for, from all of us, from um, on behalf of SOAS as well, and uh, please stay in touch, and um, you know, thank you again to everybody.